We're glad to see this good number this morning. We have several of our regulars out traveling. We pray for their safe time as they travel where they are and coming back. And we're thankful for your presence this morning. If you would turn to the little one-chapter book of Jude. In a moment, we'll be getting to the text I'm going to use in the book of Jude for our sermon. <clears throat> but some remarks to preface the sermon. I think we all know what Peter told Christians in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, that the devil, who is our adversary, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And when does the devil uh, take a vacation? He never does. One thing we could learn from the devil to be faithful to the Lord and the church is steadfastness and diligence. And he doesn't swerve and he doesn't stop at any time to any degree from doing what he wants done. And of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that should be us regarding the work of the Lord. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, not just getting it done, but abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain or pointless or worthless. Where? In the Lord. So there is a correct path to heaven. Jesus talked about the straight and narrow way. King James Version, straight is spelled S-T-R-A-I-T, not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. And it emphasizes what Jesus is saying. There is a narrow, hemmed-in passage that leads from this world to heaven. And it's made narrow and hemmed in by the will of heaven. You can't just nonchalantly walk in. You've got to be willing to walk according to the commandments of God, to the authority of Christ, who is the way, the truth, of the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. So there is a way. In fact, in the book of Acts one time, the, the church was referred to as that way. Now, coming back to Jude. Jude, of course, was written to Christians. I've said that about every book I've referred to in the last few Sunday mornings. But I preached. And it's important that we have that mindset because many times as Christians we read this and what he's saying sounds like, well, it's addressed to people outside of Christ by the things he discusses. No, Jews address to Christians. And that's a very important point. Notice verse 1, Jew the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved where? In Jesus Christ and call. Call by what? The gospel. God's power to save. Romans 1 16. It's to you that he says mercy and peace and love be multiplied. And then he addresses them as beloved. He had, you know, in verse 3, a plan to write what has to do with common everyday Christian living. I don't know what all he intended to do, but he said something has arisen. And I have to set aside what I plan to do so we can deal with this emergency. We all recognize that. As elders in the church, as preachers, as parents, people in business, in the schools, they have a plan. But things can happen to where what is transpiring means you set that aside to deal with the emergency of the moment or the need of the moment. And thus, that's what Judy say. As the Holy Spirit guided him, he wrote this to brethren, and so he said, I was going to write about the common salvation, but you have an obligation to contend for the faith. I like the way the American Standard translates it, 1901. Once for all, delivered to the saints. No more revelation. New Testament's the final revelation. When John quit writing the book of Revelation, that ended it. There's no more revelation. There's no more Holy Spirit guided information coming. This is it in these books of the New Testament. So they knew, even though he was writing part of the New Testament, that the gospel of Christ and its fullness when Jude wrote this, though it's being written down, was there for them to live and to go by. Thus, it's in the infant stage of the church as the thing was being revealed and until it was written down so we could have the complete law of liberty that James speaks of in James 1 verse 25. So he comes down as he writes to these Christians to verse 11. We get the impact of... Uh, 
verse 11. I, I wish I had time just to go through the whole thing. Maybe it's just a sermon on the book of Jude sometime. But right now, the, he, he's already set the context, the environment in which he's about to say what's written as we know it in verses 10 and 11. But he says, uh, verse 10, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Now remember, this is written to Christians. Christians need to know this. Then he says in verse 11, Woe unto them, exclamation mark, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Corey. I want you to notice that because I want to zero in on the word W-O-E, woe. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Hold all of that because I want to remind you of what we emphasize in 1 Peter 5, 8. That is that Satan rejoices when it comes to getting souls out of the straight and narrow way. He lives for that, if you can put that in terms we do as humans. That's his goal. He never quits seeking a diligent search of patient inquiry to find out how to get you personally out of that straight and narrow way. So Jude alerts his readers to beware of Satan's tactics. But that was done by all the apostles and inspired writers because Paul had said to the church at Corinth, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2 and 11. So you see, they all were warning the early church, even while the New Testament was being written, about Satan's efforts and what they needed to do. So people must choose very carefully which road they travel in life. And once we found the gospel and from the heart obeyed it and the Lord's added to the church, we must be so careful as to stay on the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. There is no other way. So to help them and us to be alert to this fact, Jude begins the thought of verses 10 and 11. He actually began it even earlier in the book. By looking at the word, now we're back to where I left off a moment ago, W-O-E, woe. That is meant to be an arresting word. It grabs you. It, it's interesting. In fact, when you understand its usage, it's heart-stopping as to the importance of it getting your attention to concentrate on what's being said. Jesus used this word to arrest the attention of people of his day in Matthew chapter 11, verses 21 through 24. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I, Jesus, say unto you, It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day, at the time Jesus was speaking. Again he says, But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Well, what's the idea? With greater opportunity becomes greater responsibility or creates greater responsibility. The people of the days of Sodom and Tyre and Sidon in those places he mentions didn't have the Son of God in flesh walking among them. And thus I learned that on the day of judgment, not only will the New Testament be for us the standard of judgment, but also greater opportunity will require greater things from those who have it than those who didn't. That's sometimes we fail to remember. Always didn't know it. But remember, we're judged according to our works. And anytime you start judging people according to their works, it gets into their opportunities or lack thereof. So that's a good word. Whoa, it's a scary word. 
There's nothing out there for you but a woe. And I don't mean a W-H-O-A. A woe. So these were blessed with his presence. That is, these places he mentions. But they refused to repent. And they had neglected a singular and unique opportunity. Brethren, as the old preachers used to say all the time, I'd rather go to hell in China than to go to hell in the United States. Why would they make a statement like that? Because nobody wants to go to hell. Being in hell is terrible. But God judging us according to our works will mete out perfect justice to even those who are lost so that they get just exactly what they deserve. And that means there's differences. And you say, well, what's the difference? I don't understand how God's going to do that any more than I know how he's going to reward the saints in heaven. But he's going to judge them too according to their works. And like one fellow said one time, he said, well, what, what if I get to heaven and, and you have more than I do in glory and honor? Well, the truth of the matter is, that's thinking like a person here <laughs> thinks on earth. The thing about it, however much you enjoy heaven, you'll enjoy it to the uttermost and you won't know how much I'm enjoying it. <laughs> you'll enjoy it according to what you invest in it here. That's exactly what's being talked about. So woe envisions the future outpouring of God's wrath on those who live unrighteously and ungodly. Woe is a reproach and a warning contained in one little three-letter word. And the Holy Spirit had Jude apply this word to those who were teaching false doctrine and thereby were troubling the Lord's body, the blood-bought church. Sometimes we get the idea that speaking boldly, frankly, to the point, and even bluntly is evidence of lack of love. Well, if it is, most a good part of the Bible is not a book of love. You won't read very far in either the Old or the New Testament till you see people, as we have said sometimes, being dressed down because of the way they live or not, don't live. Now, the reason then for this bold, frank, and candid language was that these false teachers of which Jude writes, I was going to write one thing that was common to your salvation, but there's a pressing need in the church, so I changed it, and I'm addressing them. And it had to do with false teachers. They were traveling a crooked path. Now he reaches back by the Holy Spirit and chooses three people, wicked people, from the Old Testament. And he zeroes in on one of them. They are Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Negative examples. That is, you don't want to follow their examples. You don't want to walk according to their pattern because it was a crooked path. And they were notorious in their sins. And uh, Jude used these three wicked men as, a, as examples not to follow. That needs to be emphasized. I hear a lot of people talking about don't be negative. Well, the Holy Spirit was pretty negative. He says, here are three men I'm, I, I know in the Old Testament that you people know. And you don't want to follow them. By the way, it also tells us that as we study the Old Testament, when we see how the Holy Spirit used people from the Old Testament to teach people in the New Testament, we can see how we should. And that's part of learning to write and divide the word of truth. Romans 15, 4, 2 Timothy 2, 15, 6, or, or 15. So we're talking about the way of Cain. So I'm zeroing in not on Balaam and Korah, but the way of Cain. The way of the wicked person, whether he lived under the patriarchy, the Mosaical age, or under the Christian age, is the way of Cain. And we don't want to walk in that way. And Jude's saying, I don't want you to do that either. Jude's pointing out then to us, that is to Christians, that there are signs, we might say, telltale marks of Cain's broad and crooked way or path. And they warn us in the church not to wander into that crooked way or ways. And if we find ourselves traveling it, then we need to recognize it by the truth of God and get out of it by repentance and back on the straight and narrow way. Why emphasize that here? To whom did you write this letter? 
non-Christians are Christians. He wrote it to Christians for their good to be faithful in the church. As Paul wrote, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Surely we don't need any proof of that. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17. There's no wise person on this earth that doesn't begin by understanding what the will of the Lord is. There's the beginning of knowledge and beginning of wisdom. So he has these warning signs written for the good of Christians so they will not be drawn away by these false teachers. And of course to get a full picture of them you have to read the whole of the book of Jude. And we may do that before long and look at it and give an overview of it. The first sign, a warning sign, that is in the way of Cain, so you can know whether you're in it or you might be headed that way, is being self-willed. That's the first sign that we're going to examine. That's being in the way of Cain. You know, in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, you have the original account of, of Cain and Abel, and they're making offerings to God. And they have instruction from God. They have the Word of God giving the will of God in that bygone age of how he wanted to be worshipped. Abel sacrificed the best of his flock, and the Lord received his gift with favor. I don't know what Cain brought in the way of produce, but God wouldn't receive it. He wouldn't accept it. What a lesson that is for all of us right there in the beginning in Genesis, the origin of things. Now, since faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and when you look to Hebrews eleven four, 4, it says, by faith Abel offered, notice, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which, that is, with that offering, he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. We don't want to listen and follow the instruction of Cain. We don't want to go in the way of Cain. But we want to listen to what the offering of Abel teaches us and what it speaks to us as we label under the authority of Christ. What was it? Well, Abel knew he was righteous because he had kept the commandment of God. He trusted God. He had faith in God. Thus, he had faith in the things of God. And Cain knew what Abel knew. Remember the first thing we're pointing out about the way of Cain is that one is being self-willed. So the excellency of Abel's sacrifice is seen that it was offered by faith. That's it. That's how Abel would know he's acceptable to God. That is, that he is righteous. Folks, today it's the same thing. You can know that you are righteous before God when you know you're doing God's will. It's that simple. Now, of course, you see how that implies great uh, studiousness on your part, 2 Timothy 2.15, to know the will of God. But Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8.31 and 32. So Abel was pleasing to God because he obeyed God's commandments. That's the big thing to come on that matter. Now, did uh, Cain think his produce was as good or better than the blood sacrifice that was offered by Abel? Well, we just don't know what he thought, except it wasn't good. Because the actions of a person comes from the intents of the heart, the thoughts of the heart. Regardless of why then he made the offering that he did, it was an act of disobedience. Any act that is not by faith is an act of disobedience. And again, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus by his authority, giving thanks to God the Father by him. 1 Samuel 15, 22, in the Mosaic Age, you remember that the great prophet and judge Samuel said to disobedient King Saul, 
Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. So that tells me you can sacrifice a whole lot in your life. Give up what's very important to you. But if you give it up and you don't do God's will, what good is it? There are a lot of people today that are engaged in a lot of things, taking a lot of their time away from other things. But if it's not according to the authority of Jesus Christ, it doesn't count for anything. Whenever man substitutes his own will for that of God's, guess what? He's following the way of Cain. There's where it all begins. I think you can go right on through the Bible, and you know the fights you have in your own mind, as Paul said, to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ and to set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. And then in dealing over the years in the church, you know where it all began as far as problems are concerned? In this first warning sign. Self-willed. Self-willed. Think of any problems in the home between husbands and wives, between parents and children, in businesses, in schools, wherever you want to look, the problems begin when somebody says, I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to upset the whole apple cart if I don't get my way. So there is the beginning point we make. So it was an improper disposition of mind toward God and God's will that brought about the disobedient act as a man thinks in his heart or as one thinks in his heart so is he Proverbs 23 7 that's the reason we're to guard our heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life either good issues or bad and that's why we meditate on the word of God day and night and learn to rightly divide it notice what John had to say 1 John chapter 3 verse 7 little children let no man deceive you that's my responsibility not to be deceived and he says, men will do it. Well, they're the servants of Satan. You know, Satan can't get his work done without men leading and guiding and doing it. Any more than the Lord can get his work done without a faithful church. He says, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 3, verse 7. Thus, when you comply with the commandments of God, you're faithful. By failing to do what God commanded, Cain showed himself to be unrighteous. Warning sign number two. And you'll see they're all tied together. Resentment. Cain was very upset that God rejected his offering. He didn't think about the fact that God's rejecting it because that's, that's not what he wanted. And he's God and I'm the creature and I'm to serve him according to his will, not mine. And he evidently was downcast in face and thus his bitterness was revealed but he was mad because God wouldn't accept his offering well don't you know that's not what God wanted yeah we ought to accept it anyway you don't think that's not in people today Paul offered excellent inspired advice for people to find themselves who have the state of mind that Cain was in notice and I want you to think about this before I read this passage from Paul. Every way we function, God formed us to have that. Whether it's the exercise of our will, whether it's our emotions, they all were given for good. But they must be controlled by the will of God, and I've got to incorporate the will of God in my life and then exercise my human will to keep it all in harmony. Let me give you this example. Sexual desire is not a sin. Satisfying that sexual desire contrary to and against the will of God is. Using your mouth to speak words is not a sin. But speaking those words that are contrary to God's will is. Rejoicing, being happy, showing that emotion is not a sin. But rejoicing in being happy with evil in your life or a life that's evil or evil that's in the life of others is. Anger in itself is not a sin. 
But displaying that anger contrary and against the will of God is. And without those fundamental points in mind, you're allowed to conclude a number of things in the Scriptures. Now, the passage from Paul, and it deals with anger. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Ephesians 4.26. He did not say it's a sin to be angry. He says you've got to get it out of your system according to the teaching of the Bible and handle it correctly. Christians must learn to manage their emotions. I don't care what emotion it is. That's part of living the Christian life, being faithful. And we must manage them to constructive ends. I remember Paul telling one fellow one time, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all right, unright, uh, righteousness. Well, he's the one that wrote the first Corinthians 13 great love chapter. But he still did that. Well, did he sin against what he wrote? No. It's just that he was uh, righteously indignant, form of anger, and he sinned not. He exercised his will to control his will and keep it in subjection to the will of Christ. Those who live at the mercy of their emotions, in other words, their emotions determine what they do, are walking in the way of Cain. You know, you can get angry over the wrong things, in other words. And that's wrong just as much as satisfying your sexual desires contrary to God's will. The Lord attempted to reason with Cain, but didn't do any good. God said, why are you angry? Uh, you know God knew why he was angry, so this question is for the benefit of Cain. See how God worked with this rebellious man? He could have zapped him right there and that would have been the end of it. But he didn't. Why are you angry, Cain? Genesis 4, 6. Who really should he have been upset with? Himself. Those who blame other, others for their own bad choices and the resulting problems are traveling in the way of Cain. There's not a one of us, if we're honest with ourselves and know what's going on in the light of the Bible, that haven't come across people in the church that have sought to say, I wouldn't be what I am, or I wouldn't have left undone what I did, or I wouldn't have done what I did if it hadn't been for you or them. And it's a big problem. You see it in the beginning. Adam blamed God for Eve because Eve gave him the fruit and he did eat. Did he not recognize his own responsibility? God encouraged Cain to change his course while there was still time. If not, sin already was, was ready to attack him as he gives the picture in Genesis like some sort of hungry lion does in attacking a prey. When you give in to sin, the door swung open. And Satan is not going to just enter in that one way. He's going to start using that to get in all sorts of other ways. Remember, he never quits. But there's always a way of escaping the trying times, the temptation. So Paul says there will be a way of escape made, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And this means that those who follow the way of Cain do so by their own personal choice. There couldn't be a judgment day if we were not free moral agents and make our choices for good or bad. And we've got to give an account for those choices. Instead of listening to God's advice, what did Cain do? He remained angry. He became embittered. Well, how did it work out? He killed Abel. Why would he kill Abel? All Abel did was humbly obey God. That's all he did. Out of his love of God and trust in God and his word, he simply did what God told him to do and the way God told him to do it for the reason God told him to do it. Whenever a person fills his heart with evil, mark this down. Eventually, it will express itself. Thus, Proverbs 4.23 again, Keep thy heart with all diligence, all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Evil hearts, the inward man, are nothing but ticking time bombs waiting to go off. As far as physically, if you get all wrapped up and you're an angry person all of the time, then you're going to even see it in ulcers and heart attacks and all that kind of thing. 
It will reveal itself that way. It will reveal itself in speech contrary to the word of God and what you say to people. And even in physical violence. I remember one time, and this happened before I moved there, there was a fellow that had it re really mad at another guy. And uh, I don't know whether the fellow that was so angry had a, I don't know that he had both oars in the water or not. But anyway, he wasn't, uh, he was very angry and, at this one person. And before church started that morning, this man was sitting on the back pew, the one that was so angry and upset. And the other fellow had been trying to work with him and befriend him from the standpoint of trying to show him he, he wasn't his enemy. I can't think of a better thing to do as far as Christians are concerned is for us walking by the will of God to show others we're not their enemies. So he walked up to him before services. The man was sitting on the back pew. And as he expressed his gladness to see him, the man just swung around with his fist and just knocked the fire out of him. Uncontrolled anger harms the one in whom it dwells, even as it harms others, and maybe it harms the one who exercises it more than it's the one than the one it's directed toward. Then the third sign of walking in the way of Cain, and you see they're all tied together. Self-willed. Then we've got selfishness. Self-will was the first. Selfishness. Cain found his brother in the field and murdered him. Now why? Well, he couldn't very well get to God, so he took it out on his brother. And of course, really what happened while he physically murdered his brother, he really killed himself too. Whenever a person hates his fellow man, he abides in spiritual death. The Apostle John said to Christians in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Separation from God. John used this sad story to exhort Christians to choose, we are free moral agents, a different course in their personal, watch it, their personal relationships. In 1 John 3, verses 11 and 12, again, remember, he's writing to members of the church. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. Interesting, the Holy Spirit had him select Cain too, isn't it? Not as Cain, he says, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And therefore, wherefore slew he him? In other words, why did he do that? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Again, that's 1 John 3, 11 and 12. You mean that a person can know another one has done God's will and kill him because he did it? Think about the life of Christ. In fact, think about some of the comments he made to the chief priest. You know, why, why are you doing this to me because of the evil I've done? It's intriguing to observe the connection between Cain's disposition of mind, his attitude toward God, and his actions toward Abel. Now the point is the two are inseparably tied together. My attitude towards God will have a great deal to do with my attitude toward you. My attitude toward doing God's will in my own life will have a great deal Informing the relationships I have with you, my attitude, my viewpoint of you. If Cain would substitute his will for God in worship, think about that, and he did, didn't he? He would not hesitate to elevate his will over that of his brothers, and he did, didn't he? Cain's way is a way of selfishness. That ties in with self will as we study. And those who are closest to one who's traveling this road should beware. That's why Jude writes to Christians saying, beware. Friendships, marriages, and relationships of every description have been callously destroyed because of consuming self-interest. The peace of the church has been destroyed time and time again because of this consuming self-interest and self-will. 
How did false doctrine of any kind ever get on this earth? People were self-willed, and they had their own self-interest. Remember what's said in Romans about the general Gentile departure from God? They desired not to retain God in their knowledge. And when you read the rest of it, it's basically, we're going to do things my way. Now, although fully aware of what transpired, again, the Lord confronted Cain with the question, where is Abel your brother? Genesis 4, verse 9. Now, when you read that, don't read it too fast. I want you to think about here is a mortal who has killed his brother. It all started because Abel loved God and kept his commandments, and God rejected Cain because he knew the commandments and didn't love God enough to keep them. But listen at this and think about how cold and calloused Cain has become. Where is Abel, your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4, 9. Now, where love is lacking, the love as the Bible defines it, such as Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians 13, trouble soon to follow. The golden rule, which we've had some at times wink at that, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even also unto them. And we pointed out that the way people treat one another, they can violate that golden rule. They do it all the time. So the golden rule, as we call it, has been replaced with the law of the jungle. When Christians come to a fork in the road of any relationship, Paul urged them to choose the more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and then he wrote what we have in 1 Corinthians 13. The most loving path is always the one that follows Christ's teaching. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and that there be any other commandment. It's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill toward his neighbor, or to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13, 8, 13. The fourth sign is self-deceit. Notice how it all gets with self, 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 self-deceit. That's one of the signs of walking in the way of Cain. It was also Cain's way to lie about sin. Rather than face his guilt, what did he try to do? Try to cover it up. God told Cain that Abel's blood crieth out from the ground, demanding justice. And as a result of his sin, he could no longer pursue the occupation he loved. Go back and read that. He is a man now just caught up in dreadful horror and worry. Rather than living a settled life of a farmer, he would spend his days as a vagabond, a fugitive on the earth. You think he was a happy man, a pleased man, a content man? A man with peace of mind. However, God still remembered mercy and placed a mark upon Cain as a warning to everybody not to kill him. Nevertheless, the consequences of Cain's sin were almost unbearable. He had to live with the fact that he had murdered his brother because his brother loved God and kept his commandments. How he must have broken Adam and Eve, his parents' heart, and inflicted a terrible burden on his family. Not to mention what it did to him personally, as we have. It's amazing how the long entwining tentacles of sin touch the lives of all who love Cain. Jude declared that false teachers are going in the way of Cain. Anybody that teaches contrary to the Bible are walking in the way of Cain. False teachers are descendants of Cain. Because they prefer their own way to that of God. They're selfish and quick to vent their anger on anyone who opposes them. They defy God while constantly denying any wrongdoing. I've seen it happen all my life. In the end, those who choose to walk in what we're calling in the Bible called the way of Cain must also share in his punishment. There are the marks. And if you recognize those marks in your own life or in the lives of others, and we must try ourselves to see whether we're in the faith, unless we be reprobate, this is one way to do it. Am I walking the way of Cain and I headed that way? Do you know other people that are living that way? Paul exhorted Christians then to do just that. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Every person 
must, there's no escaping it, choose a path to follow in this life, and you will do it. Jesus narrowed the path to two choices. We're back to where we started. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Why is that the case? It's the easy way. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. The broad way leading to destruction or the narrow way leading to eternal life. There's our choices. One of the two you will choose. So when standing at the crossroads with most people, the wide way seems to be the way to go. It's the easier route. But it's a route of misery when all is said and done. It's the way of Cain. Now just look at him and see if you say, I want to be like Cain. I want to have the same attitude Cain had. I want to conduct myself like Cain did. I want to treat other people like Cain did. And it all came down to this. His own brother loved the truth and loved God and kept his commandments. And Cain couldn't stand it. So don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Paul says we're not. Well, there's, there's one of them. And there's a mark. The prophets have always encouraged people to make wise choices in choosing the road and the life they will travel. 1 Samuel 12, 23 through 25. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Then Jeremiah in the last days of Jerusalem, Jeremiah 6, 16. And this ought to be the attitude of all of us, and we ought to be seeing it in our lives. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But notice their attitude. But they said, we will not walk therein. But David said in Psalm 119, verses 104 and 105, through thy precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then Jesus' statement to which we referred, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Hebrews 10, 20, the writer called or said of Jesus that he had opened a new and living way. So the question we must always ask, and answer honestly in the light of the truth of God's word. What path are we traveling right now? Is it the way of selfishness, hatred, lies, and wrath? The way of Cain. Or is it the way of Jesus Christ our Savior? The way of humility, love, faith, obedience, honesty, and grace. Well, if you're in the way of Cain... You need to leave it by repenting of those things that put you there. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness as an erring child of God. If you're one that needs to obey the gospel, then you must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we bid you to come then while we stand and sing. Amen.